Good evening. I'd like to call our May 17th Revere School Committee meeting to order. Uh, Pledge of Allegiance. Roll call the members. Mr. Ferretti. Here. Ms. Gravelisi. Here. Mr. McGuire. Here. Mrs. Rizzo. Here. Mr. Snella. Here. Ms. Ty. Here. Mayor Arrigo. Here. Approval of the minutes of the April 12, 2016 meeting. Second. Roll call. Mr. Ferranti. Yes. Ms. Gravelisi. Yes. Mr. McGuire. Yes. Mrs. Rizzo. Yes. Mr. Snella. Yes. Ms. Ty. Yes. Mayor Arrigo. Yes. Uh, public hearing regarding school choice. Um, first, I'll ask if there are any proponents in favor of school choice. That's how the hearing closed. Uh, any opponents of school choice? Hearing and seeing none. That's how the, the hearing is closed. Dr. Kelly. Oh. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I move that the Revere School Committee elect not to participate in school choice. Second. Mr. Mayor, if I could. Dr. Kelly. Um, so just before the committee votes, as a point of clarification for the audience, um, the vote on school choice is a vote of whether or not the city should allow students from other communities to attend school in the Revere Public Schools. And um, historically, I think primarily because of overcrowding in all of our schools uh, and because this, this committee and the city council and, and other uh, representatives of the city have seen it as not a good idea to educate other students in our schools, especially with the high volume of students that we already have. Um, it would be a yes vote on uh, Ms. Tai's proposal that would continue to exclude students from outside non-residents of the city of Riviera from attending the Riviera public schools. And um, again, because of the overcrowding situation that we already have in all of our schools and for a myriad other reasons, I would urge the committee to vote yes on um, committee woman Tai's proposal. Any other members? Roll I call. Made, I made, I made the motion. Uh, just Ms. Ty? I was second no. the motion. Yeah, I, I, Too late. I already did. All right, yeah. make it no, I, I just made the motion so that we could talk about it. And I think I, I certainly share that. Obviously, uh, we have too many problems of our own. We certainly don't want to take more people in. We don't have enough room. So it seems to me that it's a, that, uh, it's a given that we should vote not to participate. Thank you. Any other members? Uh, roll call on Ms. Ty's. Uh, Motion to not adopt the state option for school choice. Mr. Ferranti. Yes. Ms. Gravelisi. Yes. Mr. McGuire. Yes. Mrs. Rizzo. Yes. Mr. Sinella. Yes. Ms. Tai. Yes. Mayor Arrigo. Yes. Superintendent's report, Dr. Kelly. Thank you, Mayor Arrigo. Um, so we have several things to talk about on um, today's superintendent's report. Uh, but the, we're going to start off with two presentations. The first one um, is going to be by Nancy Burrill, and, uh, who is an English teacher at Riviera High School, and with her is Dr. Garcia, and they're going to talk about um, the program, the course that the Cultural Competency Committee has uh, put together for our students, and this will be part of the curriculum during the advisory period um, for next academic year. And after that, we're going to hear from uh, Barbara Kelly at the Paul Revere School, um, and she has one of her board members here with her, one of her innovation board members here with her, and they're going to share with us the election to work agreement that the teachers at the Paul Revere School um, have agreed to. So um, without further ado, we'll start with uh, Ms. Burrill and Dr. Garcia. Good afternoon, everyone. So um, first of all, I'd like to thank all of you for allowing us to come here and present on such a, an important matter, which is 
uh, um, the uh, multicultural curriculum that a group of teachers at the high school put together. Um, I say it's an important matter uh, because this is a much needed document in our schools. Um, we're talking about schools and a, di a district um, with a significant number of minority kids, uh, kids from different latitudes around the world, and we have to understand where they're coming from. And uh, to understand where they're coming from, we have to educate people about the diversity, uh, the cultural background they're bringing along, the language, and the way to deal with those kids or address or interact with those kids in the classroom. So about I would say six months ago, I think in November, we, um, this is all research based. It's not something that we just, a group of teachers decided to get together and put something uh, packaged. This is something that I have worked very hard uh, by conducting research in the field, coming up with uh, concrete evidence, evidence that would support the cause and work out a curriculum that addresses in a meaningful way the needs and aspirations for our, our students at the classroom. So, so my hope is that, as a principal, is that I will see this document being implemented in the advisory, where teachers and students meet three days a week, they interact with each other, and they develop personalized relationships as a way to really um, support the curriculum instruction. So I, we, the way we did it, just want to give you a little bit of context of that, the way we did it, we um, uh, tasked a group of teachers um, with the responsibility of um, putting a focus group together where they interviewed kids, they collect data, they did the uh, data interpretation, and based on that, we shared the data with faculty. They saw the way kids responded, and you'd be surprised that kids are very happy with Rivera High School. They are happy with the environment where they are. But to be a little bit more proactive and to make sure we have a document that would address future concerns, we decided to put a cohort of teachers to develop a curriculum that is research-based, as I said, that is going to be used during advisors. So I have with me Ms. Barril and the other two, three teachers that also worked on this document could not be here today, but they need to be acknowledged for their work, for the work, for the outstanding work that they have done. Their names are Atis Ngul, uh, the last name is kind of, yeah, I think, uh, well, I will just go with the first name. <laughs> um, Jenny Carabino and um, Grace Chung. They, these teachers work very hard, and Nancy Burrell is here. She's going to share a wonderful document that's very meaningful with all of you. Thank you for allowing us to be here today. Hi, everyone, and thank you for um, having us here today. Uh, next slide, Diane. So I want you to know that the foundation for this project was the Perspectives for a Diverse America, which is the first literacy-based curriculum. It allows for backwards planning for social justice, and it engages students in social justice topics, empowering them to make change. A big concern for us was ease of use for teachers, so we used the PowerPoint format. In most cases, videos are embedded, discussion questions are provided, and then there's notes provided as well with helpful hints for the teachers. Next slide. So before any teacher starts an activity in the classroom, um, that teacher will go over the norms of discussion with the um, students. And those include things like respect each other when they're talking, speak from your own experience, respectfully challenge each other, no attacks. Next slide. And things like um, a continued focus on the goal being to gain a deeper understanding. Next slide. So the four major focus areas in the PowerPoint are identity-based questions, diversity-based questions, justice-based questions, and then action-based questions. Um, so here's a little example of um, a day. So the diversity essential questions are, how do we connect in meaningful ways with people that are different from us? What's the relationship between diversity and inequality? What's it mean to say there's strength in diversity? 
And so um, this particular activity is called Circles of Multicultural South. So students put their name in that circle, and then in the satellite circles, they put identifiers or descriptors that they feel are important to them. Things like Asian American or female, student, athlete, scientist, things like that. After they do that, they, there's a self-activity in story sharing where the kids share a time when they were proud to identify with one of these descriptors, but they also share a time when it might have been painful or difficult to be identified with one of those descriptors. Um, this is from the action essential question, and it, um, the question asks, how can you create a community culture in which hate speech is both unacceptable, uh, which, which is unacceptable both online and offline? And would you speak up why or why not? For every class, we provide definitions for the students. What is hate speech, we ask them, and then we provide the answer for them. Next slide. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, so these uh, discussion questions are, what are some general ways that hate speech can be used offline? What are general ways it can be used online? And then now we show some videos where students can see hate speech online and offline and they'll hear examples of how it affects individuals, groups, and communities both online and offline. And as they're watching, we ask them, jot down any examples of hate speech that you hear. And here's a little uh, video um, that you can show. Sub Princess, what are you doing your book report on again? Um, memoirs of a geisha? Isn't well, I thought you were doing it on Moby Dick. Mm. Very funny, guys. No, actually, it's pretty sad. I just have a question. Does your dad know how gay you are? Everyone knows how gay he is. Question answered. The things you see happening online have real consequences. Will you stand up or stand by? So after students watch that video, next slide, um, and they read an article that also goes with this. We ask them questions uh, to discuss in a group. How do you think you might feel if you were the recipient of derogatory messages? What do you think, why do you think people make derogatory remarks? What might their motives be? How are these kinds of attacks similar or different to calling your opponent a loser? Next slide. So more major goals of this curriculum is to address misconceptions and provide facts and statistics for students. Next slide. So, for example, myths about immigration. We just put this up first. Most immigrants are here illegally, and we talk about it. And then we provide students with the facts and statistics that answer that question. Basically, that of the 41 million farm-born people uh, in the US in 2013, 30 million were naturalized citizens, permanent residents, and legal residents. 11 million were unauthorized immigrants. Of those who did not have authorization to be here, about 40% entered the country legally and let their visas expire. So the subjects that we cover are stereotypes, gay, lesbian, transgender rights, undocumented immigrants, misogyny, hate speech, what it means to be an American, religious freedom, First Amendment rights, Islamophobia, and opportunity, just to name a few. So thank you. Any committee members? Ms. Ty? Nancy, I, ha I have a question. I, I mean, actually, I have a million questions, but first I'd like to compliment you on it. Thank you. It's, it's really, it's a wonderfully structured and, um, um, you know, an organized way. I could see how well it could be used in... And there's about 56 lessons. Is that how many? Mm -hmm. Right. And, uh, and so this is done in advisory. Mm -hmm. How... How long is this going to take? I mean, is this a curriculum that you will use every year? Um, or is it for a certain portion of the year? Or um, is it every advisory period? I think we have advisory said. three days a week. And we could, you could probably use this about, um, because we also have gatherings on Wednesdays, you could probably use this about half time. So um, on Wednesdays, um, you know, maybe do one of these or do a gathering 
um, there's enough to last all year. There, there certainly is. There's enough to last the, through the four years yeah. of the high school <laughs> when they're here because things need to be reinforced as yeah. it goes through. Right. Um, so have you started anything actually yet? Have you, uh, I piloted a few things when I, um, I, I did a credit recovery class, um, oh, an advisory, yeah. and I did um, a couple of them just to see how they would go over, and it, it was amazing how well they, you know, it went. So I'm hoping, you know, for continued success. I know some topics are going to be tough and they're going to be yeah. difficult, and, um, you know, teachers need to understand that kids are going to disagree yeah. and so and mm -hmm. and but it, we really tried to be informative and um, just to make it a place where kids it, it, advisory already is a place where kids feel safe talking yeah. and sharing yeah. this is hard that's really hard to do and I'm sure that there will be teachers who will have some difficulty with it and there'll certainly be some kids that will have some difficulty Probably. with it too but um, the biggest danger is to ignore it right. and to pretend that it's not there. And, and I think our kids really want to be involved with social change, and this gives them a great um, first step right. to, to, to launch that. Right. It's a wonderful framework. I congratulate you Thank all. You. It's a, I'll be really, I hope that you'll come back and tell us later on how it goes. Thank you. Thank you. Extraordinary. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Tai. Any other members? Dr. Kelly? So I, I just wanted to reiterate for everybody that um, some of these topics that uh, Ms. Brill just went over are topics that the students generated that came from those focus group sessions where the kids said, these are the, these are the things that are causing us anxiety in the school. These are the things that we're worried about, that we feel stressed about, um, you know, that we are hearing negatively portraying our classmates or each other. Um, so it's really important to note that this curriculum was driven by the students. And the teachers that Dr. Garcia mentioned, including Ms. Burrill, have been in a cultural competency training course for over a year now. And they've done numerous workshops with their colleagues to help them understand how to broach these difficult conversations with students. Um, and they'll continue to do that work so that the teachers, as, as Ms. Tai pointed out, this is going to be difficult um, for a lot of teachers to undertake. And, you know, we are providing the training for the teachers to help them uh, cross that bridge of the difficult conversation and how to frame a difficult conversation and how, how to help kids extract themselves when they feel uneasy in a conversation. So I feel confident in the high school team. They always do great work, and they have again here. Uh, and I'm sure that this will go go help us tremendously uh, make our kids feel like this is a safe learning environment for them every day. So thank you. Kudos to both of you and your team. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So uh, next uh, we have Ms. Kelly. And uh, are you presenting? Uh, is Ralph going to present with you? Yeah. OK. Barbara? No, no. OK. My support. All right. And Mr. DeChico, we certainly appreciate you being present tonight, as always, with the uh, Paul Revere Innovation School and working on their um, board of directors so that we can make sure that we maintain that program well. And I'll pass the microphone to Mrs. Kelly to tell us the details of their um, election to work agreement. Um, this, every year, what we have to do is create a election to work agreement. First, it goes in front of the teachers. They looked at it. Um, approved it. Next, it went to the governing board for a vote. They approved it. And then we have to come in front of the school committee for your approval before the end of the school year so every teacher can sign this and they know exactly what they're going to do and we're all on the same page. So usually I have to wait till your calendar is approved. Um, the time, the year has just flown by. I mean, we're going to be out in a few weeks, so I have to get these signed before June 14th with the faculty, and your next meeting was, I think, the 27th of June, so we needed to, this was the next meeting. Um, the first two pages are boilerplate. They haven't changed at all. I gave you a new copy because I made an error. I don't know how many eyes read this, corrected it, and yet just before I left, I saw one, and these are hot off the presses. So that's why you have a new one in front of you. It is on page, oh, just page three is just our dates, and all of our dates this year coincide with the Revere Public School District's calendar. We at Paul Revere will have everything identical except for a half a day on every Wednesday. 
So other than that, all the dates are the same. And you can see at the bottom of page three, we wrote that regular RPS schedule. So it's there. And we added the dates of the holidays that the, the students and the teachers would be off. On the top of page four is where the error was. We had RPS, I mean, I'm sorry, PARE, -E, P -R -E, professional development, because that's what we did last year, was to create our plan on that very first day of school. This year, and I'm so glad because our faculty missed it, we will be part of the Revere Public School District Professional Development. So that is the one thing I changed. It says dis District Professional Development in the other the old copy you had said Paul Revere. So I know my teachers really missed that. We had a handful go last year. And it's really important to be part of the culture of the whole district and share in that collage with, with all the other teachers that they have because they really, it just bonds people in a different way. Working at Paul Revere is great, but you need to be part of the whole district and with your other colleagues. So I think my teachers are gonna really enjoy that. Down below are again are just the dates for the Wednesdays, for those 10 Wednesdays, because we will do every Wednesday, but we will join the district with the principal and the district, um, the director of PDs on those Wednesdays, so we listed them for the teachers. And other than that, page five is more boilerplate. Nothing on that has been changed. On page six, and I apologize, you don't have page numbers. I realize that tonight. Uh, the only extra thing that Paul Revere does is we put 30 hours in additional. Those are the before school and the after school hour that each teacher gives of themselves to create an enrichment club. So that's why that bullet is there for the 30 hours. And then the next bullet is we give additional time for our parent teacher conferences over and above what the district gives. So those are the only two things on there that makes Paul Revere unique. And the last two pages are all boilerplate from the last two years. Anybody have any questions? Any members? Okay. Mrs. Rizzo. Hi, Ms. Kelly. Just out of curiosity, who is on your governing board that's done all this wonderful work? Um, Ralph is, we have five parents that are elected by the parents. We have three, um, community members, and five teachers elected by the teachers. This year we have two teachers going off and the board will stay the same. They rotate every two years. Um, Dr. Dakin is one of our board members this year, just came on board, which we're thrilled with. Um, we have um, Joan Conley, former superintendent, and we have um, Sylvia Chang, Chang from um, the Revere those are our three community members, so we, we believe our community members are really strong this year. And we have a full board. This is the first year we really have had a full board. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you. Any other members? Dr. Kelly? So I just, I mean, I, I just want to congratulate again. I think the work that the Paul Revere School does is amazing. It's great to see a group of teachers who can live outside the box and think of different innovative ways to work with students and rearrange time to give the students more time in the school day without changing the amount of time that each of the teachers is, is actually working contractually. Um, and it's just great to see a team where there are parents, community members, and teachers sitting together at a table making decisions about how to operate a school because when you get right down to it, they're the people who are most invested in what's going on in that school. So kudos to everybody and all of our thanks to everybody on the governing board and all of the teachers at the Paul Revere School who work so hard for those kids. So, do we need a motion? Yeah, we need a roll call. Roll call. Oh, we need a oh. Do I hear a motion on the floor? Ms. Scrabalisi. I make a motion to accept um, the Paul Revere election to work agreement. Second. Roll call. Mr. Ferranti? Yes. Ms. Gravelisi? Yes. Mr. McGuire? Yes. Mrs. Rizzo? Yes. Mr. Sinella? Yes. Ms. Ty? Yes. Mayor Arrigo? Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so the next thing on um, the superintendent's report is I wanted to share with the committee and with the folks at home that um, the Revere Public Schools has signed on as a partner 
in um, a consortium called the Massachusetts Consortium for Innovative Education Assessment. So it's fitting that we fall uh, on this topic right after we hear from the Innovation School. But um, this is a partnership between eight different districts across the state, um, Revere, Ludlow, Lowell, Attleboro, Winchester, Somerville, Framingham, and Boston Public Schools are partnering with the Center for Collaborative Education to develop an alternative method for assessing student achievement. And what we hope to do, we, we've engaged in this three year long project. Um, the teachers union is engaged with us. Uh, Eric Fearing, who is the president of the Revere Teachers Association, is actually one of the co-chairs of the group together with a superintendent from Framingham. Um, and what, we're, what we seek to do is actually develop a two-tiered system that will give us an alternative to assessing student achievement other than standardized testing. Um, so it's very cutting edge, it's very avant-garde, I think. And uh, as we like to be, it leaves Revere on, um, on the precipice of innovation across the state. So in addition to these eight districts that are primary partners, there are another 30 school districts who have already signed on to pilot some of the programs that we develop. Um, so what we seek to do is develop a performance assessment program where students demonstrate their knowledge and understanding through performance assessment instead of taking these static standardized tests that really um, the, w the way we talk about it in the consortium is the standardized tests are assessments of learning when we want to do assessments for learning where the actual act of taking the assessment helps the student develop their own knowledge and understanding and prepares them better not only for college and career but also for life in general. So these performance assessments that we envision um, would give the kids just by the act of going through them the knowledge that they need to be successful in college. It's very similar to what our high school students are doing now with their capstone projects and their portfolios which the senior class has been presenting over the last week. Uh, very exciting work. But the idea is that we would extend that across the K through 12 spectrum. And you know, students would have age appropriate performances that would enable them to demonstrate for not just their teachers but also for their parents in the community what they know and are able to do and how they're prepared for the next grade level. At the same time, um, we want to look at more comprehensive systems of determining school success. So rather than just look at, oh, um, school district, Revere Public Schools, here are your MCAS results and therefore you're a level, in our case, two district, which is really great. Uh, but for other districts, they might be labeled level three or level four, which it isn't really give information about how hard the teachers are working or how much, how many gain, how much gain the student has made over the course of a year or what the relationships and the culture of that school district are really like. So that's kind of the second um, body of work that this consortium is going to work on. And Somerville, which is one of our partners, has actually taken a lead. They've been doing some work over the last couple of years and we're going to borrow information from them in order to inform our own work. And the idea is that the, the district, instead of being rated simply on standardized test results, will also be rated on the culture that they provide for their students and um, the climate for teaching and the environment of the school district and how the students and, and the parents interpret the climate of the school to be. How, how engaged do they feel by the school? Um, so we think that it's really going to be uh, some cutting edge work. We're excited to be in the forefront of that work as we always are and hope that it's going to move the district to the next level of achievement. Our goal for the team would be that three years from now when we're done creating the performance assessments and piloting the work that we'll be able to present evidence to the state that our new assessment system gives the same information about student achievement as a standardized test but does it in a much richer format that actually helps the student. Any members? Great job, Dr. Kelly. Next item. And there's no cost to the taxpayer, correct? That is correct. The entire project for three years is grant funded. Um, so the next thing I wanted to talk about is another new program that we're going to be bringing to the city. And um, this one is targeted at helping parents and students save for college. And it's a partnership with, the, with a group called Inversant. We're going to be rolling it out 
um, either in late fall or early winter of next year. We still have some work to do um, building our resources. Um, but this is a program that gives matching funds to parents as they or their students, they can certainly have their students um, put money away, um, as they save for college beginning in eighth or ninth grade, uh, this program can match up to $1,500. Um, and it's, you know, it's not a huge amount of money, but if, if the family is able to put away $1,500 and they get the matching $1,500, that's $3,000, which is probably enough for books at least for a couple of years. And in addition, you know, in order to access the ma matching funds, parents are required to attend some informational sessions where they learn how to apply for financial aid, how to apply for scholarships, how to gain access to college application information, how to help their students write their essays for college acceptance. It's really a great program. And again, um, this is a program that doesn't cost the district anything. Uh, the partnership matching funds hopefully will come from community partnerships that the Inversion Group will help us form with local businesses. Um, and the accounts will be managed. We've already uh, talked to George Anzoni in the mayor's office about establishing a, a funding account where the funds will be stored. And so parents should stay tuned. We'll be inviting them in the fall for informational sessions and to get that going. And you know, we're going to extend that invitation to parents of students that are currently in high school and middle school uh, to get them started. And hopefully we'll be able to scale that down over the next couple of years all the way down to kindergarten and get kids really thinking about college as early as kindergarten. Any members? Mr. McGuire. So you're, you're willing it out to 10th graders, like juniors next year? We're actually hoping to engage freshman parents. Anybody will be invited, but um, our, our hope is to gain, gain some folks who can save over a couple of years and really benefit from the program. There are different, different seminars every year, but I wouldn't say that juniors will be excluded. As we develop the program, I'll have more information on that. Just, just to help on the fast fare and the information. Yeah, would be, right. Would be a world of knowledge to parents because it's and a absolutely. And you know, we already um, do have informational nights, and even on these nights, all parents will be invited, not just parents who are participants in the program. So, yeah, I I have a question. So, could parents because some parents have already been saving in the, that Massachusetts account that you have. Mm -hmm. So could they simply, as part of this account, put in $1,500 and then have it automatically matched? Sure, I don't yeah. see why not. That's, well, that's a great deal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Good, Johnny. <laughs> so, it's, a, it's, it's not 1500 per year, it's 1500 total. Yep. Um, all right, the last piece of the superintendent report is a student report, and so I turn the mic to Gianni Hill, who's going to fill us on in on all the great <laughs> happenings from the student perspective. Thank you, Dr. Kelly. I would like to start off by saying that this past Friday, we had uh, two organizations, Young Voices and the Providence Student Union, visit the high school to learn more about student-centered learning um, and advisories. So students were divided up and they got to follow about five different students from the high school. They got to tour the advisories, hear more about how the circle discussions happen on Wednesdays, um, learn about how student-centered learning is, uh, work, like how it works in the classroom. And then after that we met back in the learning commons for an open circle discussion where random students that were sitting in uh, the learning commons for the period were invited to join in and kind of um, share some of the strengths and obstacles um, that came with transitioning to student-centered learning. So that was a great experience to kind of showcase the school and all the work that we've been doing. Uh, this past Wednesday, the community service team met uh, to redefine community service to create a, a centralized location where any high school student could go to learn about community service, what it is, what it entails, opportunities for it, because uh, it was brought to our attention at the school improvement team meeting last month that students were struggling to meet that graduation requirement because they felt like there wasn't enough structure in terms of having a place to go to figure out community service. So to solve that, we 
are working on a website. We have a team working on it with administrators, teachers, a couple of students. So that's been a great opportunity as well. Any students are welcome to join in. This will be an ongoing thing probably into next year. And then our hope is that the students sitting in the, at the, interning at the Genius Bar in the Learning Commons next year will be able to keep the website updated for the student body um, with opportunities that may be long term or short term, like it might just be like a walk, for example, or something like volunteering at uh, the Lighthouse for a, a couple of months, something like that. And lastly, this past Thursday, the School Redesign and Innovation Team approved the Student Senate Constitution for the 2016-2017 school year. It's been a, a year of work, a lot of work. Um, and the Student Senate Constitution also entails an appeals process, which will ensure sustainability and uh, promote like empowerment for the students, because that appeals, that appeals process includes like, for example, if an um, administrator were to deny an initiative that the students came up with, we could go to central office or the school committee and, and have them make the final decision on it. Just to ensure that we might not have ad amazing administrators in 10 years, you know, that are that open-minded to some of our new initiatives. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so it's just to kind of ensure that no matter who's in, our, like, who's in that position, that the students will always um, be empowered to come up with new initiatives. So thank you. Thank you, Gianni. Great work. Any uh, committee members have any questions? Um, uh, Ms. Ty. Well, I'd just like to point out that I had given Gianni a constitution from the 1973-74 school year, which was written by the newspaper kids. Uh, I was the advisor to the newspaper. And they were radicals. Johnny is not a radical. He's just a little different. But that was a different time. And, and, uh, and I was so happy to see them, to watch them do that kind of work. And uh, at that time, there was some resistance from the administration. This time, there was full support from the administration at every level. Uh, and um, I, think, I think Johnny himself deserves so much support for doing that. Uh, so much credit for doing it, and um, I'm very proud of him and what he has done. I'm sure we all are. He's a great school committee representative. Yeah. Certainly, we share that opinion. But it's it's wonderful that he engaged so many different parts of the community, of the high school community, um, students and adults, in coming up with this document. And um, I'm just really happy that what goes around comes around sometimes, all for the best. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ty. Uh, next item on the agenda is the approval of bills for Hill School as recommended by the Building Committee Subcommittee. Mr. McGuire. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Encumbrance DRA PSS number 20, the amount of $23,366. So moved. Second. Roll call. Mr. Ferranti. Yes. Ms. Gravelisi. Yes. Mr. McGuire. Yes. Mrs. Rizzo. Yes. Mr. Sinella. Yes. Ms. Ty. Yes. Mayor Arrigo. Yes. A complete cleaning company amount of $1,500, classroom floor cleaning. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? So moved. Uh, these are consultant invoices. Hill International, $18,880. Invoice number 50 for March 16 services. So moved. Second. Roll call. Mr. Ferranti. Yes. Ms. Gravelisi. Yes. Mr. McGuire. Yes. Mrs. Rizzo. Yes. Mr. Sinella. Yes. Ms. Ty. Yes. Mayor Arrigo. Yes. Uh, complete cleaning company, $1,500. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? So moved. McPhail Associates, $4,755.17. Invoice number 81. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? All right. So moved. McPhail Associates, in the amount of $9,785.69. Invoice 00 for June services. So moved. Second. Roll call. Mr. Ferranti, yes. Ms. Gravelisi, yes. Mr. McGuire, yes. Mrs. Rizzo, yes. Mr. Sinella, yes. Ms. Ty, yes. Mayor Arrigo. Yes. McPhail Associates, $278.45. Invoice 44 July services. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? So moved. 
McPhail Associates, the amount of $6,422.68, invoice number 45, Alpha Labs testing, July 15th. So moved. Second. Roll call. Mr. Ferranti. Yes. Ms. Gravelisi. Yes. Mr. McGuire. Yes. Mrs. Rizzo. Yes. Mr. Sinella. Yes. Ms. Ty. Yes. Mayor Rigo. Yes. Technology invoices. Uh, Valley Communications, $5,080.11, invoice 23. So moved. Second. Roll call. Mr. Ferranti. Yes. Ms. Gravelisi. Yes. Mr. McGuire. Yes. Mrs. Rizzo. Yes. Mr. Sinella. Yes. Ms. Ty. Yes. Mayor Rigo. Yes. Next item on the agenda is subcommittee reports. Mr. McGuire? Uh, oh, um, oh. Approval of the mur 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 <laughs> MOA <laughs> for part time cafeteria employees. Uh, Ms. Ty? Mr. Chairman, I move that we accept the uh, memorandum of agreement for the part time cafeteria employees. Second. Okay. Second. The, uh, the MOA consists of uh, the same raise that everyone else has got for three years, two, two, and two. And there were some language changes to make some of the temporary leaves of absence consistent with those listed in other uh, AFSCME contracts. And uh, it's, a, it's a very, it's a somewhat brief and very good um, document for both sides. Congratulations to Dr. Kelly for another successful one, and now we're all set until 2018. You think? Hallelujah. Oh. Put my mic. Any other members? Uh, roll call. Mr. Ferranti. Yes. Ms. Gravelisi. Yes. Mr. McGuire. Yes. Mrs. Rizzo. Yes. Mr. Sinella. Yes. Ms. Ty. Yes. Mayor Arrigo. Yes. Next item on the agenda is the Garfield Roof uh, Support for Funding. Mr. McGuire. Yes, this is uh, just some housekeeping and a motion. I'd like to propose a roll call vote in support of the City Council's allocation of funds for the Garf Garfield School Roof Project. So moved. Second. Second. Roll call. Mr. Ferranti. Yes. Ms. Ms. Gravelisi. Yes. Mr. McGuire. Yes. Mrs. Rizzo. Yes. Mr. Sinella. Yes. Ms. Ty. Yes. Mayor Arrigo. Yes. Next item on the agenda is policy amendments. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Rizzo. Thank you. Um, policy subcommittee met May 9th. Um, we discussed the amendments of JLCD, administering medicines to students, which is the same policy, but we just added um, NACAN to it. Also, EBC, emergency plans. The only change to that was to comply with the statutory change. JJF, student activity accounts, um, an additional page was added um, regarding graduating class funds. And IHAMB, teaching about drugs, alcohol, and tobacco was, um, it's to be filed on the DESE website. So we are asking for the following policies to be amended and asking for a motion, please. I make a motion to accept the following policies amended. Thank you. Second. Roll call. Mr. Ferranti. Yes. Ms. Gravelisi. Yes. Mr. McGuire. Yes. Mrs. Rizzo. Yes. Mr. Sinella. Yes. Ms. Ty. Yes. Mayor Arrigo. Yes. Ms. Rizzo. Okay. Also, on May 9th, the policy subcommittee met, um, and these are to be adopted. IJN, DC, Internet Publication. Um, basically, it's just to add a piece, hmm, oh, it's for the supervision and approval of web pages. Also, GBEC, Drug-Free Workplace Policy, it's just um, basically safe and secure environment, of course, we want that. Um, and ECAF, security cameras in school, and basically, other than the locks on the doors and stuff, it still adds an extra um, environment of safe and secure atmosphere. So with that, I make a motion to accept the following policies for adoption. Second. Roll call. Mr. Ferranti. Yes. Ms. Gravelisi. Yes. Mr. Yes. McGuire. Mrs. Rizzo. Yes. Mr. Sinella. Yes. Ms. Ty. Yes. Mayor Arrigo. Yes. Next item on the agenda is the School Department Communications. Um, Mr. McGuire? None. New business. 
None. None. Late communications, none. Motions, uh, Ms. Tai. Uh, even though we have spoken at these meetings many times about our opposition to lifting the cap on, cap on charter schools, we have been requested by the Save Our Public Schools Committee, which is a consortium of you know, teacher unions, um, uh, uh, administrators unions, uh, PTAs, any number of people from all aspects of the state, uh, all working together um, so that we can try to uh, block that initiative to raise the cap on charter schools. We have talked about them over and over again, about um, yes. how they will hurt Revere, how much money we I'm actually sorry. lose right now from Revere to charter schools. It's uh, almost $2 million, and it's certainly $2 million that we could use, uh, besides the fact that we have really good public schools and really great schools. And the answer to making public schools better is not to take money away from us, but to to feed money so that we can feed our kids these knowledge. So I move that we, um, that we also pass the resolutions against lifting the cap on the Commonwealth Charter Schools as presented to each of us individually by the coalition Save Our Public Schools, mass.com. Is there a second? Motion to accept. Second. second. Roll call. Mr. Ferranti. Yes. Ms. Gravelisi. Yes. Mr. McGuire. Yes. Mrs. Rizzo. Yes. Mr. Sinella? Yes. Ms. Tai? Yes. Mayor Arrigo? Yes. Uh, public comments? I got extra time. <laughs> <laughs> Wave the ring. Uh, no, that's quick. Three minutes. Three Thank minutes. you for your patience, Ralph. Ralph Chico. Name and address to the record. Ralph the Chico, 49 Washington Street, Rivera. Um, basically, I just have a quick question, um, comment. And I don't mean to open any can of worms or anything. It's just just a question on subcommittee meetings and hearings and so forth. And uh, just basically, do the school committee um, rules of order state anything that they can't take place in the school committee room um, so that it can be aired live along with all the regular, regular school committee meetings that we have? Um, so this way, I believe it would coincide with the open meeting laws. and. Uh, not that it may or may not already coincide with the open meeting laws that are out there, but I know some people don't know um, what's going on and what can be seen this way. Everybody can see it and that there is a there is something that can fall back on and take a look at it um, during the meetings. And I just also hope that it, I think it would help that there's full transparency so everybody knows what's going on so that uh, nobody can say, well, this was, this was going on, that wasn't going on. So everybody can see what's going on. Just, just, just a proof of thought. It's certainly something to take under advisement. Uh, I know that we are complying with the open meeting law by the posting and by the meetings mm -hmm. being open. Um, I think we can have a discussion as a body about um, having them televised. I don't know how many people need to see our, or my, my ugly mug on TV, but um, Mr. Franti. Yeah, but sometimes, Ralph, we can't get the school committee room, so we have to have it where we can get it. Because sometimes the room is booked, and sometimes yeah. we'll do a meeting, like maybe like a two-week notice, and then we'll go to the secretary seat, and we get the room, and they'll say, no, you have to have it here. Right. It's not that, you know, we're not doing anything. It's just that we have to right. take whatever room we can get at. Ms. Ty? Uh, Ralph, I chair the personnel subcommittee, and... For that, most of it involves contract negotiations. Right. Most of it in includes things that maybe that we would don't want to feel make, exactly in exactly. the law and basic right. fairness. That's you basically know, that would fall under executive that, session. That be an executive That's session. That's executive yeah. session, yeah. right? And it's it's uh, I can't think of a time when it wasn't that, right. you know, because otherwise, you know, it's there. And and when we do the um, when we do the budget next week, there'll be a, a summary of what changes we have made, for example, in personnel mm -hmm. and, uh, um, and in other areas as well, so that you'll understand you know, not only what the final figure is, yeah. but what ha how we got to that final figure. So. Okay. But it's, it's, a, it's a good suggestion. Thank you. Okay. Mrs. Rizzo. I applaud people like you that pay attention all the time um, I, I think it is great to have transparency. 
like Mr. Ferranti said, we usually take a room um, that we can get. It is posted. It doesn't matter which room. The public is always welcome to come. I would love to see, I don't care if it's two, I'll take one. I would love to see people that take an interest and come to any subcommittee meeting or even any um, school committee meeting. I know they're not the most um, entertaining <laughs> piece of viewing, but um, it's really where they're going to say is here what's going on in our schools. Um, maybe not in executive sessions, but exactly. you know, we want the public to be involved. We want the parents to be involved. And um, again, I applaud you for coming. And next time, bring a friend. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Rizzo. Any other members? Uh, next item on the agenda is a payment of bills. So moved, Mr. Chairman. Second. Roll call. Mr. Ferranti? Yes. Ms. Gravelisi? Yes. Mr. McGuire? Yes. Mrs. Rizzo? Yes. Mr. Sinella? Yes. Ms. Ty? Yes. Mayor Arrigo? Yes. And with that, uh, our next meeting will be June 7th at 6 p.m. And, uh, oh, the 4th? The, the 21st. Me May or June 21st? June 21st. Okay, June 21st is our next school regular school committee meeting. Uh, with that, do we have a motion to adjourn? I make a motion. Uh, Ms. Franti, good evening.